okay, we've built our first classifier model and we've measured performance of that model and, and we seem to have done reasonably well. We achieved an area under the curve, an AUC of something around 0.7 or so, which is a, a fair distance from random, which is 0.5. But now it's time for me to admit that I swept a couple of details under the rug and, uh, and we need to take a step back and look carefully at uh, these issues before we make real conclusions about how our model is performing. What I'd like to advocate here is that fundamentally we really don't care about how a model performs on the training data that, that are used to construct the model itself. Really what we care about is how the model performs on data that are statistically independent of the training data. In particular, this comes up in the fact that we want to build a model now, given the information that we have, but we want that model to be able to perform well on data that we draw uh, sometime in the future. One of our hazards in the model building process is that our model can dramatically overfit the training data, which means that if we just look at the performance metrics for the training data, uh, it can look quite good. Uh, but that doesn't tell us anything about how well we're going to perform with that future data. So the ideal approach to looking at this is to uh, go out to the world, sample some data. We use that for training of our model. And then we go and draw an independent set of data that we use for the testing process. So, so we play that in, we ask the model what, uh, what it predicts, we compare that against ground truth. And, and then we can compute uh, some sort of performance metric like area under the curve or pure skill score, something along those lines. But one of the things that we have to keep in mind here is that the, this whole process of sampling data from the world, building models is actually a stochastic process in and of itself. Just the sampling process involves randomness as we're selecting data. But a lot of the model building procedures that we'll talk about actually involve a certain degree of randomness uh, as well. This is the case for the SGD classifier. Randomness plays into the choice of the initial parameter set uh, before it starts to do gradient descent. So what this means is that even if we're measuring the performance of a model using test data, this metric is actually a random variable. And we're going to very quickly get into a scenario where, I, where we want to be able to compare one model against another model or a model with a certain set of hyperparameters against the same type of model with different hyperparameters. And we can't do that comparison in a valid way on the basis of one sample from a random variable. So if you remember from your statistical hypothesis testing experience, in order to properly compare one thing against another thing, we actually need to go out and sample uh, uh, the random variable multiple times uh, in order to construct a distribution, which allows us then to compare uh, this one thing against another. In practice, in the machine learning world, this, we, we tend to work in the 20 to 30 uh, kind of a range, and there's some statistical reasons for, for doing that. Uh, so so this, is, this is where we'd like to be, and, and if data are really easy to come by, then, then this is the type of approach that we would use. But now we have reality, and, and the reality is that data tend to actually be rather expensive to collect. It, it might be the collection process itself that's expensive. It could also be the case that collection is easy, but the, the labeling process is rather expensive. So, so one of the situations that this shows up in is uh, if, we want to, uh, if we want to apply a label to a set of images, the way we might solve this is to employ a human to sit down and, and give labels to a, a set of images. And, and fundamentally, a human can only uh, label uh, so many images in the course of an hour or the course of a day. 
it's also the case that our models can be quite hungry for data in the training process. So as, what this means is that as you add more and more training data, the performance of the model, even on a test set, will continue to increase. This happens typically with, with limits. Uh, at some point, the, the model performance will, uh, will asymptote, uh, but we also don't know exactly where that's going to be. So, so these are concerns that we're going to have moving forward. But fundamentally, what this tends to mean is that we can't get all of the data that we really want to uh, do a proper independent model building and testing process. And so the fallback position is something called cross-validation. And what I'm going to present uh, right now it parallels what you see in your book. It, it's actually an incomplete story. Uh, it, it leaves out some important points. This is something that we're actually going to address here in a few weeks. But the approach right now that the book uh, talks about is one where we take our data set, we cut it into uh, some number of uh, essentially equal size pieces. We call those pieces folds. Uh, K here is our number of pieces. And then we go through a process where we don't build just one model and test it. We actually build K different models. That first model uses folds zero through K minus two for the training process. And then we use fold K minus one to do the testing. The next model, we use folds one, two up to K minus one, and then turn around and use fold zero for the uh, testing process. Okay. so. I'm going to draw our, our entire set of data here on, uh, on the screen here. And I'm going to assume for simplicity that K is equal to uh, 10. In practice, we really want K to be more like 20 to 30 uh, type of a range. Um, so, so the individual samples are arrayed along the horizontal here. And now let me split those samples into 10 different pieces. There's 10 and give those numbers. So it's easier to, re, uh, to refer to them. So there's zero through nine. Okay, so model zero, the approach is to use folds zero through eight for training. And then once we build that model, then we use fold nine for testing. Model one, we use folds one through nine for training. And we use fold zero for testing. And then let me show you what model two looks like. So, so for zero, we, we started at fold zero. For model one, we started at fold one for training. For model two, we're going to start at fold two for testing and go out to nine. But then we wrap back around so that we get our ninth fold for, uh, for training. So this is for training as is fold zero. And then this fold here, fold one, we use for the testing process. The process continues to proceed in this way. The test fold continues to rotate through uh, the set of available folds until we get to uh, model nine, which is our last model, and uh, and then we are done. So what this means is that uh, for model zero, we had this test data set. We get a model performance on, uh, based on that test set. And then for model one, we get a statistic here. And for uh, model two, we get a statistic here. In the end, we end up with K different values. 
And if K is large enough, we can start to get a good sense of what that distribution might look like. Let me say one other thing um, the book does not yet talk about, but it's, it's a topic called stratification. In, in the chopping process that I presented uh, up at the top here, uh, I assumed that we were just chopping the, the data, but the reality is that uh, this, this chopping process really has to be careful to make sure that we end up with a, a reasonable sampling of both the positive and negative uh, examples. Or if we have a multi-class problem, we need to make sure that all of the classes are represented inside of each of the folds. So what tends to happen is that uh, we'll have a we'll have all of our data here. Uh, the, we have all of our, we have our positive examples here. And we have our negative examples. We line those up. We then go about chopping these up independently of one another. So those are equal size. Uh, in in practice, if, uh, if if our if we don't have a balance between positives and negatives, we, we'll have an imbalance uh, from uh, the positive folds to the negative folds. But that's okay. And then uh, these two folds here, let's switch to a different color. Uh, fold zero of the positives will get merged together with the with, with the samples uh, from the uh, negative side. So zero will get matched to zero, and then the samples from fold one will get merged together with the samples from, uh, from fold one of the negatives. And in, in this way, we can actually ensure that every one of the folds actually contains that uh, a nice distribution of positives and negatives. As I said, we're not building now just one model, we're actually building K different models. And with the way that we're selecting data for the training process, the data from one model to the next actually overlap with one another. It's not a complete overlap, but, but there is an overlap. Um, however, the testing data that we use to compute our test metrics, these data are never used in the model building process. And this is with respect to a, a, a single model. So, Model I uses uh, certain folds for construction of the, the parameters and then another fold for the testing process. And those are uh, non-overlapping. Another important point about this process is that a single data sample is only ever used as a member of a test fold uh, exactly once. So what this means then is that our test statistics that we gather up, we get one from each model, these st test statistics are independent of, of one another. And this will make our statistical hypothesis testing that we want to be doing in the future uh, easier to, to accomplish. So this cross-validation story that we've talked about so far, uh, in particular what's presented in the book is, as I said, uh, incomplete. I wanted to make a couple of other points uh, so that you had these in mind uh, as we move forward. So in, in particular, one of the kinds of things that we want to be able to do is uh, hyperparameter selection. And we'll talk more about uh, hyperparameters. We hit a, a few with our uh, SGD classifier. Um, one of the things that we should never do is to use our testing data to make choices about what these hyperparameter selections uh, ought to be. The other thing that we will want to be able to do is compare different types of models. So I might have my SGD classifier and I might be comparing that to a decision tree. In, in the end, we don't want to choose one over the other on the basis of, of testing set uh, data. And, 
uh, and to solve both of these, we're actually going to introduce a, a different notion, uh, which is validation data. So we're actually, in, in the long run, going to be chopping our data into three different chunks, a, a proper training set, a validation set, and a, uh, a test set. Um, one of the things that you want to be careful about in the book, and, and this happens throughout the scikit-learn documentation and on the net as well, is that they tend to confuse the testing set with the validation set, and they tend to use those two terms in, uh, interchangeably, and the reality is that those really are different things. So as I said, we'll, we'll get back into those in not too long.